Hello again. Earlier today, I shared a bit of um, poetry about reconciliation, kind of the grander story of reconciliation, and how that affected me on a trip I took to the Middle East and to Israel and the West Bank, and how that story um, tied in with the grander story. And I want to share just two poems now um, where that, that greater story of reconciliation breaks into my more personal life and my family kind of later on. Um, so I'll just read two poems. Um, I've been married happily for 13 years with three children. Some of you may have seen them <laughs> on campus earlier. And, but when we first got married, we struggled quite a bit. Uh, my wife has a pretty serious skin condition called eczema. Some of you know it, have it. Um, it can be really bad. Marriage um, is wonderful and amazing, but also challenging. Have you heard that before? Um, not to mention when there's something really difficult where you can't even touch each other. So in the beginning, we struggled. And through poetry and through being able to focus uh, at least a little bit later in life now, kind of going back, I was able to articulate and ask those questions about what it meant. And so this is a part of that story. Of elk and marriage. Point Reyes Station, Thule Elk Preserve. At Tamales Point, above the bay, I hold my wife's hand. She's quiet again, lost again, deep within her brown skin, hiding from the eczema. She's not slept for days. The itching mostly comes at night, and these same hands which bless and love and hold become blades in cracked and earthy skin. But today, she's trying to be a fine wife. The truck shifts slowly along the edge of the windy road to the Thule Elk Preserve. Hunted for 100 years until ranchers found a remnant, gave the elk space and time to find each other again through shy wandering, a quiet faith and purpose. I search for them across rolling grass where redwoods tower in distant groves and storm clouds press into the valleys. The truck window fogged in salt water blown from Point Reyes. The elk appear from a stand of trees. Rain is falling in the meadow. I pull to gravel, turn off the car. Silent, she looks at me, her eyes cruel with pain and obligation. What, she says. Look, I say, and spot a bugling male. He's gathering in his harem, collecting as many cows as he can. Amazing. I hold my mouth in awe. She's staring at me. The air in the truck is lost, sucked out. Her eyes are not her own. My eyes are not my own. It is this moment, under a cold and quiet sky, we lose who we think we are. Husband, wife, in sudden and dire warmth, I open the door to bitter air, and she shivers, I hate this. Her hands recoil, her body constricts. The rain batters us into talking of our new marriage, nature, love, promises, expectations of a fresh life. Elk walk across the wet plain. We are far from what we understand. She takes off her wedding ring, slips it through slender fingers in tight circles. Months before in Morea on our honeymoon, I waited on a motu, watching in my blue trunks, snorkel in my hand from the small island. I saw her sitting curled up beneath the hut, her skin darkened beneath a wide hat. That morning, I convinced her to try to go into the water, promised her that salt water is mild in the South Pacific, and it would not sting her broken skin. Desperate, unable to touch her, I thought the vision of the reef would remind her of her strength. The water burned more than my false promise. Her skin is worse now, welted over, hushed. In our disagreement, we wait for our commitment to work. What did I expect of her? Her brown eyes blistered in the storm. I leave the truck, climb the rise, let myself fall into the far country. This is what I understand. The sky, the elk, the sea beyond, and the rain. This was not my prayer, a life with her or anyone else. I never believed in marriage or the truth of faithfulness until the night we first met. Our slow push and pull of fingertips, hands folding into rest unlooked for. There's a burning in my legs, 
sudden air between the bay and the sea. I feel I might somehow turn to grass, that she may never change, never see this or care, never be better again. The elk bull watches while cows graze, the rut season has come on. When I walk toward the truck, the window, roll, the window is rolled down. The rain blows in, her arm is wet and alive, her hand is reaching for me, an unexpected gesture. I slowly fit it into mine, I'm slipping in the gravel. Across the road, an elk calf stands in the tree line watching us. And I'm gonna close with this poem, which puts together um, quite a bit of what else is in the book about children and other aspects of the story of reconciliation that occurred in my life. Um, one of the carryovers of my Jewish tradition growing up is that we celebrate Shabbat. And it's a really great thing to do that every Friday night we do all the stuff. You have to do at Shabbat and we light candles and we say prayers and we sing songs and we invite everyone and anyone over um, from all walks of life and we just stop all that we're doing and we do this. And it's not always easy, but there's always a lot of joy. Shabbat. Shabbat candles flicker even as I load the dishwasher in direct violation of Talmudic law. Quiet at last, I cover the challah and drink the wine from the kiddush cup. The children sleep with songs on their lips and the crickets have begun. On the kitchen wall, there's a picture of my father standing in the desert looking west in his cowboy hat. One of his best days before he died. I whisper, we keep the Sabbath now. A jewel of tradition carried back from Israel. A year ago in Jerusalem on the Sabbath, our friend Emil looked across the table, whispered as if the secret must not get out. Hebrew is about the symbols, the language of the heart. Bitter herbs, candles, the eye, the bush, the sea, the temple, the Shema. There is no room for these symbols. These symbols are in the life of the mind that pours over books, reaches into proofs by paper and scrolls, by dig and chemical. Emil smiled and spread his hands across the cedar table. Remember the Sabbath, he said. Keep it holy. Find the symbols. January in Jerusalem, standing on the roof near the old city, the stars are bursting over Bethlehem, and I'm talking on the phone to my father, making him promises he does not deserve. I remember tonight, plate by plate, the irreverent and wonderful chaos. My daughter's Hello Kitty dish, swimming in butter and honey. My son's plate is clean. He ate it all, even though his bottom never touched the chair his legs dancing from uncle to grandmother through every loving and biting reprimand, his face gleaming in the silver salad bowl. My mother each Friday, her Jewishness awakened, tells stories of Greenwich Village and Brisket's past. Her plate picked at, her fork wandering from rice to lettuce to hummus and back, lonely olives swim in soaked bread and spilled wine. She looks for my father, eats in terms of him, longs for the ferocity of his youth and even later when he could no longer get the food to his mouth. My brother fingers his phone, eats. He's searching for God in every bite, quiet in his wondering, afloat in Sabbath peace. And my wife finally sits down, each bite separate, perfected into magnetic clusters from every side of the platter. The baby is asleep now in her arms. The candles burn in the twilight kitchen, and I linger above the lights until the wax spreads itself into paraffin heaps, a quiet like walking in the woods. The mess is the symbol, the still small voice. These empty plates sweeping the floor, the loveliness of her hands kneading the bread, twisting it with the children hand in hand in the late afternoon. This is a real thing, something permanent, a cord tied from this kitchen from the table leg to cedar, acacia, clay, and brush. There are times worth remembering. The story of this night has happened before, the beginning of impractical rest and impossible forgiveness. If we can just do this, I think, we can make it. Thank you. <laughs>